The cool surfaces of the surrounding stone walls and low ceiling shimmered under the humanoid's heat. Nestled within this stairwell, she stared wide-eyed at the creature's glowing back. From the colorless night to the shadowed gloom of the fort's first chamber, being face first with this fiery light, she almost felt warm enough to throw her hood back, but she didn't. If any mechanical traps were set in place here, the humanoid would receive the blow and the light would be snuffed out. A self-destructive blast would engulf the stairwell. The only protection she would have against it would be her cloak. The creature continued to descend, its glide over each stair a gentle breath, in and out, a steady pace. The only sound was that of its heat. She always thought that it had been the thing's breathing, more like a constant whispering hiss. Never words, not like she thought she was hearing now. Her eyes flicked from the space between the creature's shoulder blades to the back of its head. No way it was speaking. It didn't know language. She shifted to the right, her shoulder nearly brushing up against the wall as she tried to look past it. Someone below? Because of the light, she couldn't tell if the stairwell was about to end, bringing her and the humanoid to an opened doorway. Had she already given herself away? The words she was hearing could be the beginnings of a curse, if that was the case. Smirking, she stopped and lifted her right hand. Straightening her fingers side by side, she pointed her palm forward. The humanoid halted. Its arms and legs jolted outward slightly as it arched its back and tilted its head back. The light inside it died, its molten skin already transparent dimmed, revealing nothing within the creature's body. Like an afterimage, its outline faded from existence. She was smothered by shadows she hadn't known were there. The stairwell was featureless and chilly. Her eyes grew wider, searching for definition. There below, she found a soft glow of orange light. It was peeking through a doorway where those words continued to whisper from. Guessing where the stairs were, she eased her way down, wondering if the mage speaking this curse was forced to finish it or have it come back on them. Then again, something else entirely could have been taking place. If the mage had trapped themselves in mid-incantation, she had an idea. Reaching the last stair, she pressed herself against the wall and eased forward. Her red hood would blend well in that orange light, so she risked slipping her left eye beyond the edge of the doorway. In one second, she tried to map out the room, but then she locked in on slight movement to the left. There were two thick pillars of stone standing along that half of the room. They were positioned in a line going toward the back wall. From her perspective, she was able to see a portion of that far back corner between them. A bundle of cloth was gathered along the floor. From the way it was shaped, she assumed it to be the whispering mage. At first, she thought they were crouching down, but they were lower than that, as if lying prostrate, their brow pressed against the cold surface underneath them. She tried to move further out into the orange light to see what it was they could have been praying to, wondering if her previous assumptions of what was happening were wrong. From what she could see of the wall in that back corner, there was no statue, no shrine of any sort, not even a set of markings she might have recognized. Still, she gathered the mage was facing away from her. Whatever was happening, this was a good chance to enact her plan. Sliding further into the orange light, she pressed her back against the threshold of the doorway. Then she extended her right hand, palm pointed toward the mage. She then shifted it a bit to the right, aiming for the space between the mage and that back wall. A sphere of red light bloomed before her palm. It then shrank down and disappeared. The bundle of cloth flinched and popped up whenever a large sphere of red light swelled into existence in that back corner. 
She tore away from the threshold and hurried over to the left side of the room. Before aligning herself with the mage who was rising to sit bolt upright, she entertained the idea that she might have fooled this person into believing they had finally summoned whatever spirit they were calling to. That was, if they were worshipping in the first place. If not, then they were suddenly aware that someone had invaded their space. Dashing forward, she was already waiting for the ghostly blade to finish forming in her outstretched right hand. In those few seconds it took her to close in on her target, she was able to map out more of this side of the room. Along the floor, between the line of pillars now on the right and the wall on her left, were two sets of iron bars. Forming grid-like patterns, they were recessed within large square-shaped holes. These two holes occupied the majority of this area. The only solid flooring between them was about half the width of one. Approaching that first hole, she glanced down, seeing how close together the iron bars were. Close enough one could stick their hands through. The mage was sitting in the middle of the other hole, staring at the glowing red humanoid floating in front of them. She had to make this quick. Trying not to think too hard about it, she ran across the iron bars, feeling multiple precarious sensations against the bottoms of her boots, and then she was racing across the short, solid stretch of stone before closing in on the mage. Both her and the humanoid raised their hands, readying flame and sword to strike. The humanoid swung its arm down, breaking the body of fire upon the mage's head. The flames growled and engulfed the mage just as she plunged her ghostly blade in their back. Someone laughed out loud then. Just as she jumped back, positioning herself in the middle of that short stretch of solid floor, that one syllable of laughter echoed from some place nearby. Some place other than the mage who was getting up off their knees to stand upright. She hesitated. Despite burning alive, the mage had taken their time getting to their feet. Now they were facing the humanoid, but made no move to defend themselves. The humanoid had lifted both hands, clapping them together to be wrapped inside a large body of fire. Then it brought both hands down onto the burning mage. The impact forced her back along the edge of the solid flooring. The mage had been replaced by a roaring pillar of fire. The orange hot tongues licked in all directions, forcing her back further. She stopped herself when her left foot dropped down and found slight purchase on one of the iron bars below. With her focus divided, she couldn't ignore the fact that the mage buried within those flames wasn't reacting at all. No wailing or flailing about. When the initial burst subsided, she thought she caught a glimpse of the mage's head. The hood that once covered their head had been burned away, along with their hair. Their skin was bubbling and blackening, falling away from their skull, but still they remained upright. The humanoid, having recovered its previous posture, hunched down and then launched forward. Crashing through the remaining flames, it collided with the mage, and both came her way. She dashed to the left, pressing against the wall just as both the humanoid and what was left of the mage went flying by. They crashed into a heap of flames and flapping limbs onto the grid of iron bars. Already, she saw parts of the mage dropping through the gaps, each traced by the tongues of fire attached to them. Still, the mage didn't cry out. Moving away from the wall, she whispered to herself, This is... There was laughter again, not from the mage. This voice was echoing from behind her. She turned to look at the set of iron bars lying inside the hole closest to the back wall. I did it, a man's voice cheered from down there. I actually did it. He laughed again when she was forced to whip back toward the front of the room. The humanoid crashed against the wall and dropped along the edge of that first hole. It gripped onto the iron bars, trying to prevent its limbs from poking between them. Another impact came from the mage. They had slammed both fists onto the bars. Flames spit forth from the charred skin around their arms. The action had given the mage's body a jolt, allowing them to spring upward into a staggering upright posture. Their right foot slipped from the iron bar it was perched upon. 
When whatever was left of their leg dropped through the gap, they reached it down, grabbing onto the grid. Flaming bits of flesh dropped into the space below, but she was looking into the mage's face. Now, just a skull with burnt leather for skin attached in places, their eyes were gone. From within the shadowed sockets came forth a faint, pale, violet glow. Necromancy, she whispered, smirking. Without a word, the dead mage lurched forward, its leg catching between the bars. The mage jerked, ripping the leg free to drop below. It lunged forward again. The humanoid, which had gotten to its knees, reached out and snagged the dead mage's left arm by the wrist. Their forward momentum faltered and then renewed when their shoulder popped loose. The mage hunched down and looked as though they would lunge at her feet, but they caught the solid flooring with their remaining hand and went into a roll. The remaining legs swung upward and then came down for her. She rushed forward, calling forth another ghostly blade that manifested just in time to slice through the middle of its charred calf. Trading places with the mage, she heard the snap of brittle bone, caught a glimpse of an ankle and foot, along with a length of a shin flying in some random direction. The mage rolled onto the grid of iron bars over the second hole. She twisted about just as the humanoid got to its feet, flung the severed arm away, and regained its floating ability. The bundle of bones that constituted the mage spread out across those iron bars. Gripping one of them, the carcass tried to push itself upright with its remaining arm. Psh, she scoffed, waving her right hand about. The ghostly blade was already losing its substance. Now, she was simply dispersing the smoky tendrils into the air as the humanoid held a ball of fire in its right hand. Those glowing orbs in the corpse's sockets targeted the projectile as the humanoid flung it forward. There was nothing left for the mage's remains to do but take the hit, but she thought she saw it try to lunge forward at the last second. This only hastened its demise. The flames struck the corpse in the face and kept going, carrying the skull into the back wall. There, both it and the flames shattered to pieces. The pitiful torso and a set of hips with a thigh slumped along the grid of iron bars, no longer animated. The last growl of flames dispersed, and once again, she was left with the whispering heat off the skin of the humanoid at her side. The silence was broken by a low chuckle. From the space below the partial corpse, a man's voice cooed, Are you mad? She thought he sounded a bit older, not quite elderly. Taking this time to scan the room, remembering that this was the prison she was told about, she saw an exact copy of the setup of this side of the room over on the opposite side. The only large difference was the giant space between the four stone pillars. Several feet from the doorway she came through, a wide set of stairs led down to a lower section. Hanging from the center of the low ceiling were two iron apparatuses. Extensions curved down and out from their cores. At the end of each extension were small platforms where candles sat. Some of them had already burned themselves out, but there was enough light to see the opposite wall of the space below. Toward the back wall, shared by lower and upper area, she saw another grid of iron bars, but there were hinges along one side. She saw the latch with the lock mechanism along the other side. Just like she was told, there were two large prison cells on either side of the room. She was standing on top of one. If she would have taken those stairs down, she would come face to face with the third prison cell and its door in the back wall. She had a feeling, though, that she wouldn't have to go searching the other cells. Stepping up along the edge of the solid flooring, she looked down into the second hole. The space below was submerged in darkness. She couldn't see the old man down there, but she didn't need to. She could still hear him chuckling to himself. You're not Samson, she said. No, the old man giggled, but he's the one who killed that mage. But it was you who reanimated it, she stated, kind of glad she couldn't see him. He was nothing more than a voice in that darkness. Samson. The old man responded, still giggling. 
He gave me the words to say. She didn't know Samson practiced necromancy. He had been more like her, though he had focused on having ghostly weapons in his hands than summoning elemental aids. You're his friend, aren't you? The old man asked, a smile in his voice. Did you and he become friends? She asked. He kind of just left you here, didn't he? Ah, but you see, the old man replied, he gave me freedom. Arching an eyebrow, she questioned, did he now? What, the old man asked, don't you understand? Now I can find out what I am capable of. Just as your aid stands at your side, why? He chuckled again. Even though you dispatched the one, this fort is now full of bodies. He began to laugh. He continues to help me. I no longer hear the sounds of fighting, of dying. How many do you think there are? For one who just received words of necromancy, she wondered what else the old man had practiced before being locked up here. Had he trespassed, hoping to learn something from these mages? Or worse? I see it as a game, he continued. After all, that one you dispatched didn't seem like they had a key on them. Maybe it's hanging on the wall near the door? He giggled. She didn't bother glancing back toward the front of the room to see. Or maybe someone else has the key, the old man pondered aloud. I'll just have to figure it out, one after the other, until I get the right one. He started laughing to himself. Unfazed by his behavior, she shrugged and started to turn away. She got the information she needed. She didn't come here for this stranger. Besides, it seemed better he stayed locked up down there. Attempting to cross the first grid of iron bars before reaching the front of the room, she heard the old man's laughing getting louder. It was as if he knew she was leaving, and he wanted her to hear his glee. I can sense them, he said. Though he didn't lift his voice, it carried about the confines of his large cell and the low ceiling of the prison. All I have to do is search. No matter how much stone is placed between me and them, no matter how many turns down corridors, I can still feel them, and they'll answer. When I call them, they'll be my new friends. She left that room, followed by the radiant humanoid, glad she was covered by her cloak, because she could almost feel the old man's laughter slipping past her and traveling up the stairwell.